You are listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of Thomas Murray. Galway in the west of Ireland is one of the most popular places to visit in Ireland, both for those abroad and for other Irish people. It's a place full of art and culture, and the scenery is iconically Irish. The east of the county is less travelled, despite its historic ruins and lush green fields. Even less visited is the border between Galway and Roscommon, where you'll also find bogland interspersed with the pastures, and it's there you'll find the small village of Ballygar. From the large square at its centre, its past as a prominent market town in the area can be seen and it's been a focal point of that area for a long time. And it's been holding a carnival since 1945, with a fun fair, sports tournaments, a dance and so on, and it was a feature of village life. It's a fairly typical rural Irish town, with farming and Gaelic games, bog cutting and a tight-knit community being its main features. William, or Willie Mannion, was in 1981 an elderly farmer living alone about six miles north of Ballygar, in Craig on the Galway-Roscommon border. He was 73 and had never married. He had lived with one of his five brothers, Tom, and both had worked the family farm, until Tom's death. Three other brothers had emigrated to the US. Another brother and his only sister had moved to other parts of Ireland. He was a hard worker and well-known in the community. He was sociable and had time for everyone, but loved nothing more than a good chat about politics or current affairs. He loved Gaelic games and his church. He was a typical bachelor farmer in 1980s Ireland and was a well-liked man. On Sunday the 19th of July 1981, Willie Mannion went to Half Eleven Mass. After Mass, he said hello to neighbours and friends he recognised from the surrounding area, and then he headed home. He had to get back to the farm, and he also had some matches to look forward to that day. He had his 30 acres let out to a neighbour, Thomas Dowd, but he still had a hand in, so to speak, and helped his neighbours out. At about twenty past six that evening, Willie was out with Peter Dowd to help tend to a sick cow. Willie was seen again between half seven and quarter to eight by another neighbour, Martin Kelly. It was usual on Sundays for Willie to call to yet another neighbour, Bob Cunningham, to watch television for a while. But that Sunday, Willie didn't go over. Just after 10pm that night, there was a knock on his door. He was surprised by the caller, but nonetheless invited him in and made a cup of tea. The next evening, as it got dark again, Martin Kelly noticed that the lights were on in Mannion's home, but the curtains had not been drawn. Irish people seemed to keep a particular eye on the state of people's curtains. It's unusual to see them undrawn at night or closed over during the day. My mother used to give out to me that neighbours would think there'd been a death in the family if I refused to open the curtains in my room. It was unheard of for Mannion to turn the lights on in his house while leaving the curtains wide open, and so the concerned neighbour rang the local Garda station. The Gardie arrived at about 11, and when there was no answer to their knock, a guard looked through the letterbox in the front door. They broke it in when they saw Willie slumped on the floor of the kitchen. When they got to his body, it was clear that he was dead. There were what looked like a number of stab wounds to the old man's head. The crime scene was established and the local doctor was called to pronounce the death. An incident room for the murder investigation was set up in Roscommon Garda Station, which was the nearest large Garda Station, despite being in the next county over. Willie Mannion's body was brought to Roscommon Hospital and awaited the arrival of the chief state pathologist, Dr John Harbison. When he performed his post-mortem, he confirmed that there were multiple stab wounds to the elderly man's head as well as wounds to his face and neck, which had resulted in blood loss and ultimately death. Harbison concluded that the blade that had been used was only four or five inches in length, and that it had had a tapered tip. An investigation unit made its way to the area, while the local guardie began to come up with a list of people they thought might be involved, known criminals in the area. What was strange, though, was that there was absolutely nothing missing from the old man's home. He still had £200 in his trousers pocket, and elsewhere in the house Willie had stashed another large amount of cash. It was there, untouched, just like all the rest of his belongings. This didn't seem like a robbery, which is unfortunately the most common reason an older person living in the countryside might find themselves targeted. One of the locals who the Gardaí contacted was a 17-year-old youth, Thomas Murray, from Clune Lion, again near to Ballygar, less than two and a half miles away. He was the youngest of two boys in the family and was a bit of a loner. He had few friends and people thought he was strange. And he had been in trouble before. While at school, he was suspected of damaging other kids' bikes by slashing their tyres and he was fond of poking other kids in the back with the sharp end of a compass. He was not a good student, and only made it through one year of secondary school before he dropped out and started working full-time on his family farm. He had been in more serious trouble since leaving school, too. In 1979, when he was 15, he had sent obscene letters to a female neighbour, whom he'd taken a dislike to, 
and he was suspected in an attempt to set her car on fire. She brought the matter to the attention of the guardie, and he was charged with unlawfully using language towards her, calculated to cause a breach of the peace. Before the matter got to court, however, it was dropped. He had apologised to the neighbour, shook hands, and agreed to leave her alone. As the local guardie had put his name forth as someone to check out, the investigation unit asked for Thomas Murray to come to the station, and so on the 28th of July he showed up voluntarily to give a statement and to account for his movements the week before. He told them that on the day of the murder he'd cycled to Ballygar for the half-eleven mass, and had in fact seen Willie Mannion at the time. After that, he said he'd went home and had his dinner, and started listening to the Cork versus Kerry Gaelic match. He hopped back on his bike at a quarter past five, and went back into Ballygar. He thought that there was a pony show on that night, but he was wrong. So instead he went to his uncle's. It was near to his own home in Clune Lion, and he stayed there until half seven, getting back to his own home at about a quarter to eight. He sat watching television through to the nine o'clock news. He told Gardy that that day he'd been wearing a black and brown striped shirt, blue trousers, and a black jumper. But after watching television, he decided that he'd head back out to go to the carnival in Ballygar, and so he put on a clean green shirt with a brown jumper. He got back on his bike at half ten and cycled back into the town, just as his father was leaving to go to the pub in Mount Bellew. He told the guardie that when he got to the carnival, he didn't go in, but stood outside the wire there, watching for about twenty minutes before heading home. He said he'd stayed there for about twenty minutes before heading off out again. He got home at 2.35 that morning and didn't leave the house again. He said when he got in, his mother had gotten up and made some coffee. After reading over the statement, he left the Garda station, leaving some seriously suspicious Garda in his wake. The investigation was gearing up, and quite soon, intervening events would drive it even further forward. Thomas went home, and he found his brother's tablets for epilepsy, and took the lot of them. He was rushed to Roscommon Hospital that same night for an overdose of drugs. When the doctor saw him, he was groggy and confused, and he told them about the tablets. He also told them that Gardy were asking him about a murder in Newbridge. A little later, a nurse, Pauline Mahon, spoke to him, asking him how he was feeling and what he had taken. He told her that he had taken the tablets and that he had gotten them from his brother. When she asked him why he had taken them, he told her, quote, I was in trouble. I killed a man, end quote. This nurse was pretty quick off the mark, and she asked, how did you kill him? With a knife, Thomas said. She asked what he'd done with it, and he said he dumped it, and that she wouldn't know the place. Nurse Mahon let the guardie know exactly what had been said, and so then they had a prime suspect for the murder of Willie Mannion, and soon an officer turned up at Roscommon Hospital to keep an eye on Thomas Murray while he recovered in his bed. When he was discharged from hospital, Murray went home to his parents to recuperate from the overdose, and he kept a low profile. His parents were known to be very protective of him, and he rarely left the farm in those days, except to carry out chores for his parents. Gardy kept an eye on his movements and on the Murray house. They needed an opportunity to talk to him again. Eventually, it was noted that a few mornings a week, Thomas would leave his house in the very early morning to go to a nearby bog to collect turf with a donkey and cart. On the 2nd of September, two Garda detectives were sent to sit on the route that Thomas took to the bog, in the hopes that Thomas would head out to the bog and that they could catch him alone to talk and see what he might have to say to them about the night of the murder. They came across an old abandoned house on the laneway to the bog and holed up there, armed with a flask of tea and sandwiches and preparing for a long day waiting for the team to walk by. There was no guarantee that he would. One sat studying for his inspector examination and the other had a deck of cards to amuse himself. After a few hours like this, they heard the cart rumble up the laneway. Thomas was heading home from the bog, cart stacked with a load of turf, heading back towards his house. The guardie stopped him and told him that they were investigating the murder of Willie Mannion and asked if he would sit into their car with them for a chat. Thomas said he'd go wherever they wanted, and so they drove west, towards Newbridge. The guardie asked him to tell the truth about what had happened that night and what had happened with Willie Mannion. Initially, Thomas said that what he'd said back in July, what he had written in his statement and signed his name to, that was the truth. They had him go over his movements on the 19th of July again, and again pressed him to tell the truth. One of them told him that they thought he was in some way involved in the whole thing. After a moment, Thomas replied, quote, All right, I stabbed William Mannion. That's the truth. Now you have it. End quote. The detectives immediately cautioned him, and started up the car to go towards Ballina Slow Garda Station, Thomas kept talking as they drove. He said, quote, I'm in trouble now, end quote, but continued talking. He said that that night he'd cycled to William Mannion's and he'd knocked on the door. The older man had let him in and they'd been chatting when Thomas took out a knife he'd hidden under his jumper. He'd stabbed him a number of times in the face and neck and then he'd left Mr. Mannion dead in a corner of his kitchen, covered in blood. Thomas then got on his bike and cycled home. He threw the knife away into a bog on his way there. By the time Murray stopped talking, the guard car had pulled into the yard at Ballinasloe, but he didn't want to go in. He said to them, can we not talk here? 
so instead the Gardaí kept him talking in the car. He went over stabbing Mannion once again and went on to tell the Gardaí that he'd gotten the knife from his uncle, James Mulvey's house, which he'd then hidden in a field days before. He'd sharpened it himself. He said he knew he'd wanted to kill somebody, but hadn't decided to kill William Mannion until that Sunday morning. That night he'd gotten home at half eleven, washed up his hands, which were covered in blood, and then he'd gone off out to the dance that was in Ballygar. He told them, quote, I don't know why I did it. I'm not sorry over it, end quote. The Gardaí asked him to come into the station and to make a statement, and Thomas remarked that he might as well now, given he'd told them so much. He entered Ballinasloe station at twenty past two, and the detectives read over the notes that they had taken during their talks in the car. Thomas signed them. He then drew a sketch of where he had tossed the knife, but said that, as it had been dark, he wasn't so sure about where it had ended up. He drew a map of Mannion's kitchen and marked out where everything was, the table, chairs, oven, clock, and the corner he'd left William to die in. He said he'd known he was going to kill Mannion that morning, after Mass. He said he'd been planning it, but not for too long. He still gave no reason for his actions that night. Murray also gave samples of blood and hair. Thomas Murray was charged before a special sitting of the District Court at Ballinasloe the next day, and was remanded in custody. On the 4th of September, he brought a detective sergeant out to the spot that he had mapped for the guards in the station, and it was searched. The knife was located, and there was blood on it that was tested and found to match the type of William Mannion. Murray was sent to await trial at St. Patrick's Institution in Dublin, where its mental health team described him as emotionally immature with a low IQ. They also said he was borderline psychotic and showed elements of schizophrenia. By mid-December, he was sent to the Central Mental Hospital in Dundrum. The trial of Thomas Murray for the murder of William Mannion began on the 16th of February 1982 in the Central Criminal Court in Dublin before Mr Justice Sean Gannon. Murray's defence team began by arguing that the statement that their client had made admitting guilt of the murder while in Ballinasloe Garda Station was inadmissible. They said that at the time the statement was made, Murray had been in unlawful custody due to the fact that he had not consented to going into the station. This resulted in a trial within a trial of sorts to determine whether the statement could be heard by the jury. The Gardaí who had waited on the road for Murray were called to give evidence as to the conversations that they had had with Murray that morning, outside the abandoned house, in the car and in the station. They said Thomas Murray had agreed to go with them anywhere they wanted to talk. They had taken notes as Murray spoke in the back of the car and he had signed the notebook that the guard had taken them down in. Justice Gannon noted that the notes that the Gardaí had taken stated that Murray had not wanted to go into Ballinasloe Station and that, despite this, he'd been brought in. The judge found that Murray had not consented and that therefore he had not been in lawful custody when the admission at the Garda station was made. The confession from that time was inadmissible, and the jury would not hear it. However, because the notes that the Gardaí had taken had been read to Murray, and he had signed them to verify that they were accurate, these could be used in court. And the notes of the conversation outside the station gave the full story of Willie Mannion's murder as well. But even still, it wouldn't have been the end of the world had all the confession evidence been deemed inadmissible. Nurse Mannion, who had treated Thomas Murray the night of his overdose, gave evidence of the admission that he had made to her while in her care. Forensics also placed Thomas Murray at the crime scene. He had left a thumbprint on the front door latch at Mannion's, in blood matching Willie Mannion's blood type. The knife had been found where Thomas had said it would be, and the Gardaí would have had no way to locate it without this information. In the end, Thomas Murray was found guilty of murder, and was denied leave to appeal the next year. He was sentenced to the mandatory life imprisonment and was returned to the Central Mental Hospital where he stayed until April of 1983. He was transferred into Mount Joy where he stayed for a year before making his way to Arbor Hill and taking up residence amongst others who were also serving long-term sentences. In October of 1985, he was punished by the prison services for refusing to obey an instruction of a prison warder not to spit on the floors. He was transferred back to Mount Joy in November of 1985. Eight months later, the governor there asked for him to be psychiatrically assessed once more, which led to a liaison meeting regarding him being held between the prison authorities, the probation services, and the medical officers. It was noted at this meeting that Murray had requested a transfer to an open prison. There were a number of meetings held in relation to this request. Murray was six years into a life sentence for a serious and violent crime, so many of the professionals involved were not in favour of granting permission for this sort of move. Subsequently, though, one of the psychiatrists at the Central Mental Hospital said that, as Murray had not been found to be suffering from any particular disorder, he knew of no, quote, medical contraindications to any phased release program, end quote, due to his presentation throughout his stay in Dundrum. He went on to say that if Murray was to ever be discharged, he would require a lot of supervision. The Minister for Justice denied his applications for supervised release and early release at this stage, but this didn't put Murray off. He kept applying. You've all heard of Anne Frank and Auschwitz, 
But how many of you have heard of Yanis Korchak and his bravery and refusal for his own safety when he had 200 orphans who were transported to a certain death? How many of you have heard of Charlotte Delbo and Peter Gantz? What about Ladici or Kristallnacht or the Cotton Wood murders? I host Holocaust Lost Voices, a podcast that gives a voice to those victims, heroes, and places that have been lost in our history books. Join me as we discuss these lost voices of the 20th century's most horrific crime. You can find us on Apple Podcast, Podbean, Overcast, or your favorite podcatcher. In May 1990, Murray's case came up before the newly established Sentence Review Group. This was a group set up in 1989 to advise the Minister for Justice in relation to prisoners serving long-term sentences, and this was the board that would review life sentences, or sentences longer than 10 years, after seven years had been served by the prisoner. The review group made recommendations to the minister and devised plans to work towards temporary release, or release on license. The sentence review group was replaced by the Parole Board of Ireland in 2001, and this functions in much the same way. In Murray's case, reports from the Central Mental Hospital and prison governors were considered when his case came before the board in 1990. A Garda report relating to Murray stated that he was extremely violent, and that any release of this man would constitute a threat to the community, which, in fairness, is what Garda reports on prisoners usually said. It was agreed at that meeting that Murray had characteristics which would require a lot of support and supervision, but that he would benefit from knowing that he was making progress towards a possible temporary release, which might improve his overall well-being. He would certainly benefit from the mental health care that he would get in the training unit, and it might help him understand why he had committed his crime. If after that he had made a good amount of progress, he might be moved onto a low-security facility, like Shelton Abbey, and possibly eventually released. A year later, the Minister for Justice approved the Sentence Review Group's plan to transfer Murray to the training unit and said that his case would be kept under review, awaiting any progress he might make there. Plans were made to move him onto Loggin House shortly after, where he'd firstly be allowed out on day trips to the cinema and local shops, and also to stay with his parents, with a view to granting temporary release to his parents' home within 12 months of that move. In December 1992, he was granted permission to spend seven days with his family for the Christmas holidays. He continued to participate in the programme laid out for him and to be allowed to see his family until March of 1995, when it was decided that Murray should be allowed out on a two-week renewable temporary release. He would live with his family and work on their farm. He had spent time in and out of the community in the last nine months with no incident, and it appeared to the authorities that the community in general accepted that he was going to be released soon. In January of 1996, there was an incident where Thomas was assaulted by his father, A senior probation officer was called in to resolve the issue, and temporary release continued. Until September of that year, when Murray was suspected of setting hay bales alight in the locality, along with some belongings of a local member of the Gardaí. There had also been other breaches of curfew, and a Garda said he had made lewd gestures towards young girls. A file was sent to the district Garda office, but it was decided that there was not enough evidence to send the file on to the DPP. Thomas Murray was transferred to Mount Joy by the end of that month, but then quickly on into the training unit yet again, and by Christmas of 1996, he was sent on to Castlereagh Prison. By April of 1997, Murray was allowed back out on day release, and under close supervision from the probation service, had secured a job in Galway City, working on a building site. He was out on his renewable release again, and by September, his conditions were loosened to allow him to check in only once a month, and to give him a later curfew. But on the 15th of July 1998, an incident involving Murray occurred in a park near to the centre of Galway City. A woman saw him expose himself to a group of young kids who were playing in the fisheries field area, just behind the cathedral, next to the river Carob, which runs through the city. She started towards him shouting, which got the attention of a group of teenagers who began chasing after Murray. The woman called the police and Murray was picked up when the teens pointed him out. He was brought to the Garda station and was quite agitated. He insisted on making a phone call and rang his dad, telling him that the police had picked him up again. This statement was overheard by a Garda who decided to run their detainee's name. It was then that they saw he was out on probation for murder. Murray was subsequently sentenced to six months for indecent exposure and was returned to Castlereagh Prison. In January of 1999, he was allowed out on accompanied visits to see his mother who was gravely ill and to attend her subsequent funeral. Again, the idea of giving the man some incentive to behave by discussing the possibility of probation was brought up by the Probation and Welfare Services. By July 1999, he was allowed out once a month for a day only, when he would be picked up by his father and returned to the prison in the evening, which was then increased to once a week. During this time, the governor of Castlereagh Prison was sent a memo from the Probation and Welfare Services that said that Murray was feared in his locality 
and therefore it would not be suitable to allow him overnight visits, and that his thinking was, quote, highly distorted in his personal relationships, and that the vindictive and petty side of him, frequently seen in prison, was directly tied to his offending, end quote. It became routine that Thomas Murray would be collected on Monday mornings from Castlereagh Prison by his father. He'd go back to the family home, help out on the farm, run errands for his father, and then return to the prison that evening. Most of the time his father would bring him back, but sometimes he'd arrange other lifts to bring him back by curfew. On Monday, the 14th of February, 2000, Nancy Nolan, an 84-year-old retired schoolteacher, drove into the town of Ballygar at about ten past twelve. She had some chores to do and some shopping to get. As she went around the town, she chatted to a number of people that she met. When she got back to her home, she left her car parked on the road outside the house, which was unusual for her. She usually parked it in the garage. Nancy had taught in Ballacley National School, as had her husband, Tom, who had died five years before, 1995. She lived in the two-storey house on the outskirts of Ballygar on her own now, her own children grown and with their own kids living in other parts of the country. The next day, a neighbour rang Roscommon Garda Station to report that her neighbour Nancy wasn't answering her phone, and her car had been left unmoved in the street, and she hadn't been seen all day. Nancy's family had tried to ring her, but she wasn't picking up the phone. When they couldn't get her, they rang the neighbour, who noticed that something seemed off. Just after lunchtime, at 1pm, a Garda sergeant called to Mrs Nolan's door with two other officers. Her neighbour had met them and handed over a spare key she had to the house. When they opened the door, they saw Nancy's body lying in the hall. She had suffered severe head wounds, and it was immediately clear to them that the poor woman had been attacked. The house was sealed off and the local doctor rang to come and pronounce the death. Again, the house of an elderly person living near Ballygar was sealed off as a crime scene and the body of Nancy Nolan was sent for post-mortem. Quickly, the Gardaí realised that Thomas Murphy was a prime suspect. He had been out on day release on the 14th from Castlereagh Prison and had been seen in the village of Ballygar. On the 16th, the Wednesday following Mrs Nolan's murder, two search warrants were issued by the district court. One for the house and land of Thomas Murray Sr., Thomas's father and the other was for Murray's own cell in Castlereagh Prison. The guardie seized some of his clothes, a black jumper and tan jacket. A month later, on the 20th of March, Thomas Murray was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Nancy Nolan at Castlereagh Prison, and then brought to a guard station where he was questioned. He said he had nothing to do with the old woman's death. He hadn't seen her the day of the murder, and in fact he hadn't seen her for two weeks before that when he had spotted her in the village. The fibres from the seized jumper were compared with some found on Mrs Nolan's body, and it was concluded that they were similar, while fibres similar to Mrs Nolan's clothing were found on Murray's jumper. Finally, on the 24th of April, Gardy got word that Thomas Murray wanted to speak to them. They went to Castlereagh Prison and sat down with him. Murray admitted his guilt to the Gardy and said, quote, It's an awful thing to do, to kill a woman like Mrs Nolan, end quote. The morning of the 14th, his father had collected him from prison and they drove home. They stopped at a shop to buy pork chops for themselves for dinner and continued on. Mr. Murray Sr. was alone on the farm the rest of the week and looked forward to collecting his son and having company on Mondays when he got to visit. The two did a bit of work around the house and then stopped for a cup of tea. After that, Thomas Jr. announced that he was borrowing the car to go into the village. On his way out the door, he picked up a lump hammer. Murray drove into the village and parked the car. He first called by a barber's to get his hair cut, but it wasn't open. Then he went to the vets and got some eye ointment for the cows, which his father had said he'd needed. He visited the local graveyard, where his mother had been buried the year before. He went to the local shop and bought some loose tobacco to make up his own cigarettes. And then he went and got back into his father's car. He described how he had gone to Mrs. Nolan's house and had hit her several times with a lump hammer that he had brought with him. He'd taken her glasses with him when he was leaving and had thrown them and the lump hammer into a field near to his father's farm. He gave the guardie a description of the boggy area that he'd thrown the hammer and glasses into. And when it was searched the next day, both items were found. Thomas Murray was charged with the murder and appeared at the Central Criminal Court in December 2000, where he pleaded guilty. If he had chosen to go to trial, there were 167 witnesses that could have been called upon, everyone from other prisoners at Castle Ray to forensic scientists and local people in Ballygar, as well as the guardie who had found Nancy's glasses and the murder weapon. Nancy Nolan's five daughters attended the court hearing and heard the prosecution outline the facts of the case for Justice Paul Carney who then handed down the mandatory life sentence for the charge of murder. Murray was transferred to High Security Arbor Hill Prison, where many of those serving long sentences find themselves. Without the hope of eventually being allowed some sort of temporary release, Murray was less concerned with his behaviour inside. In 2004, he attacked two senior prison officials. He was working in the fabric shop, which made bedding for the Irish prison service, and grabbed an iron bar and swung it at the men. He missed, thankfully, and he was got down on the ground quickly by two other prison guards. It came out that a few weeks before the attack, he'd told a fellow prisoner that he wanted to get his hands on a hammer 
to attack a staff member. This incident resulted in him being moved to the Midlands prison in Port Leash, where he is highly monitored and can be kept in seclusion, if his behaviour necessitates that. Thomas Murray has also been linked to other crimes, committed while he was out on temporary release in the 1990s. On the 1st of December 1997, when Murray was living on the east side of Galway City, renting a room from a couple, there was a violent attack. A man matching Tommy's description was seen in the area. A taxi driver, Eileen Costello O'Shaughnessy, was beaten to death just outside the city that night. Her body was found at Tinker's Lane, on the Tomb Road, and Gardaí in Galway identified Murray as a suspect almost immediately, but denied this for a number of years. He had in fact been arrested and questioned at the time, but he had told the police that he had been at home at the time of the attack. The person who killed Miss Costello Shopnessy drove the taxi away from the scene and left it abandoned in the city. Gardaí thought that Murray hadn't been able to drive at the time, given that he had first been imprisoned at the age of 17, before he would have been able to get a license, but it turned out that he'd actually been taught to drive while in prison. On top of that, the couple whose home he was lodging in later told the police that they were in fact not home on the night in question, particularly between 8 and 9pm when the taxi driver was attacked. Thomas Murray was questioned yet again in relation to this murder in July of 2001. However, Eileen's family believed that she knew her killer and that the person responsible for her murder is still at large. There was outrage in the wake of Thomas Murray's guilty plea and second mandatory life sentence. People were appalled that Murray had been allowed out and rightly said that if he had not been allowed the privilege of these days out with his dad, then he would never have killed Mrs. Nolan. It was also noted that the local guardie had considered him dangerous and a threat to the safety of the local community in Ballygar. An independent report was commissioned by the Department of Justice into the circumstances surrounding Murray's release. In July 2001, the Olden Report found that there had been 73 meetings between Murray and the Probation and Welfare Services between August 1998 and February of 2000. The report recommended a tightening of procedures as well as a general review of the temporary release system for prisoners who had committed violent crimes. There had been discrepancies in the records discussing Murray's case which led to allowing the temporary release in the first place. Olden noted that despite the problems he had observed in the procedures and the fact that Murray had a quote-unquote difficult personality, there was no way to predict that he would have committed a murder in the 12 hours that he had been released that day in the care of a responsible adult such as his father. The report also went on to say that there would always be a certain amount of risk involved in temporary releases from prison, and that despite this, it was important in terms of rehabilitation that those kinds of risks be taken. The report went on to recommend that those serving life sentences get the benefit of therapeutic services from the beginning of their sentences rather than starting at seven years, that cases be reviewed if there are any breaches of the terms of temporary release, and that every tool available be used to assess how dangerous a prisoner might potentially be to the public. In Ireland, once someone has been found guilty of murder, they are subject to a mandatory life sentence. The judge has no discretion whatsoever when it comes to sentencing, which sort of gives the impression that the whole thing is quite straightforward. You're convicted of murder and then therefore spend the rest of your life in prison. But of course, that's not the case at all. A life sentence does technically last for life, but that doesn't mean that a convict will spend the rest of his life in prison serving out that sentence. The length that someone stays in prison varies from case to case, and in Ireland the average period for those who are serving life sentences who are subsequently released is about 12 years. The Minister for Justice is the only person who can decide that release is appropriate, but he or she is often guided by the parole board, which usually begins meeting with those serving life sentences after seven years. There is currently a bill making its way through the Oireachtas, the Irish Houses of Parliament, that would see this minimum being raised from seven years to 12 though the Penal Reform Trust wants to ensure that supports continue to be put in place after seven years to help in reform and prepare for any eventual release. And yet others have shared concerns that this new 12-year minimum to be served behind bars doesn't become a sort of default release date. Thomas Murray is today serving out his two life sentences in Port Leash Prison and is unlikely to ever be allowed temporary release again. Thank you for listening to Mens Rea, a true crime podcast. If you like what you heard, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review or tell a friend. It really is the easiest way to support your favourite podcasts. A big thanks this week to our newest supporter on Patreon, Kevin May. You guys are all so generous and I appreciate it so much. My patrons keep this podcast running and help me to create new content for you. If you'd like to help out, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash mensreapod. There are perks and bonus content up for grabs. Thank you to some five-star reviewers over on Apple Podcasts. It's been a while since I looked at the Australian podcast store, so... Forgive me that these are completely overdue, but thank you for five stars from Kent Park Street. You had very kind words about pretty much every aspect of the podcast, and I thank you very much for that. You're very kind. Thank you to Good Nightmares. That is a lovely podcast out of Australia as well. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your five stars. I definitely head over and check out that podcast. Thank you to Lee Mary E, Diamond Star 101, 
And also, what about this? Thank you so much for all of your kind words and your compliments about the podcast. It really is heartening to see that so many people are enjoying this content. Next time, we have a special treat with an episode chosen by one of our patrons, Eamon Brady, in a bizarre story where rural County Clare and Las Vegas are brought together by an unassuming housewife and a hitman. This podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host Sinead. All sources can be found in the show notes or by visiting our website, www.mensreapod.com. Till next time, don't do anything I wouldn't do. William Man William Mannings William Mannions William William Mannions <laughs>